Thanks, Tim. Great to be here. Really appreciate uh, Share Cafe hosting us today. Uh, so yeah, I look forward to uh, sharing with investors today, uh, Empire Energy. We are focused on the Northern Territory's Beedaloo Basin. Following a recent acquisition, we have a commanding position in this basin, which has uh, substantial resource potential uh, and has been earmarked by both the Northern Territory and federal governments for accelerated development to resolve short forecast shortfalls in uh, Australia's East Coast gas supply. If we turn to the first slide, uh, as Tim mentioned, we've got a market cap of about 170 million. We're very well capitalised. We've got about $28.5 million cash in the bank at the moment, and that leaves us really well funded for an upcoming drilling program. Uh, following a recent acquisition of Pangai Resources Northern Territory Properties, uh, Mr. Paul Fudge, a highly successful gas entrepreneur, is now our biggest shareholder. Dale Elphinstone, also noted for his successful investment in Queensland Gas as a major shareholder, uh, as are Macquarie Bank and Texan um, uh, private equity focused oil and gas firm, Energy and Minerals Group. Turning to the next slide, we've got a very strong board of directors. Under my leadership of the company, we've really transformed this company from an old focus on mature conventional producing assets in the US and really focused on the world-class potential of the Beedaloo and our board are entirely new. Uh, Paul Espy, our chairman, uh, was uh, previously head of Bank of America's Australian operations. He founded Pacific Road Capital. So a long track record in investing in the resources sector. I worked at Macquarie Bank in their oil and gas team for 10 years. Peter Cleary uh, has a long and successful track record on the commercial side of the oil and gas sector, particularly at Santos and BP. Lou Rosman joined our board recently. Lou was one of the pioneers of commercialising coal seam gas in Queensland. And John Warburton, who also sits on the board of Senex, is a highly credentialed oil and gas explorer who identified the potential of our assets 10 years ago. Uh, given Paul Fudge's new shareholding in our company, he has very recently joined our board. So looking to the, new, the next slide, you know, why Aussie gas? Well, Australia's facing some major shortages in gas and indeed, the world's facing major shortages. We've seen enormous increases in prices over the last 12 or 18 months. Um, you know, gas prices reached quite low levels last year due to COVID related supply disruptions, but the world's not producing enough gas. We're seeing the impact of this on Australia's East Coast with gas prices increasing very substantially recently. And, you know, this is one of the major reasons the Australian government has launched the gas fired recovery strategy. They recognise that we are short gas. If we look to the next slide, not only does Australia need more gas, but Asia will need a lot more gas, and particularly as we go through the energy transition. Gas is the perfect complement to renewables because it provides dispatchable power um, that can particularly meet times of peak demand and low renewable supply, but also it's a critical feedstock for everything we rely on in our modern daily lives. And despite the fact that there's been a huge build out of LNG export capacity around the world in recent years, the demand profile is forecast to increase dramatically across Asia, including in energy transition scenarios in the decades ahead. Finally, just uh, on the next slide, looking to the looming gas shortage that I've referred to. So Australia's East Coast gas supplies are really starting to run low and they, it's, it's creating a looming shortage. Historically, the Bass Strait has provided cheap gas for Australia's East Coast and those fields are starting to wind down. Um, you know, the uh, coal seam methane fields of Queensland are reaching peak production, but a lot of those fields are going into LNG export and uh, LNG imports are not going to fill the hole. They'll be used for uh, peaking power in the, in the high demand winter periods, but there's an enormous shortfall and the Beedaloo Basin can solve that. And the federal government, as I mentioned, has recognised the potential of the Beedaloo with its 200,000 odd petajoules of prospective resource as the potential source to uh, solve these gas shortfalls. If we move to the next slide, this gives you a bit of a sense of the scale of the Beedaloo. So as I mentioned, around 200,000 petajoules of potential recoverable gas, over 500 trillion cubic feet of gas in place or 500,000 petajoules. So this is an enormous basin. Uh, this is a shale gas basin. And the, and the reason I joined Empire was that in my former career, I witnessed the extraordinary uh, benefits that came to the US economy from shale gas development. 
the Beetaloo has very strong similarities to some of the key technical aspects of those US basins. And indeed, now shale gas is 70% of US gas supply. Uh, the federal government's backing in the industry uh, through their Beetaloo Strategic Basin Plan. That includes providing uh, drilling grants to offset the cost of up to 25% of drilling activity. And we were the first company to get approvals for that work. Uh, we've got more um, uh, companies we understand that will be getting access to those grants as well. And uh, we're doing our bit to move this basin into production. If we move to the next slide, I'll give you a quick overview of the recent transaction we've carried out, which is the acquisition of Pangai Resources. So historically, we have over the last 10 years held leases on the eastern margin of the Beetaloo and right up through East Arnhem Land, which is the MacArthur Basin Central Trough. On the western side of the basin is Pangai Resources. As I mentioned, Pangai is uh, owned by Paul Fudge. Uh, Paul was one of the uh, pioneers who recognised the potential of coal seam gas in Queensland and sold those tenements in Queensland for a very substantial profit. And then he redeployed some of those profits into the Beetaloo, recognising the potential of shale. Um, we're delighted that Paul has decided to partner with us by merging these asset sets together. And it gives us an enormous area under lease. We have nearly 29 million acres under lease, around 42 trillion cubic feet of gas recoverable. That's a P50 perspective number. To put that into perspective, an LNG export terminal needs around four to five trillion cubic feet of gas to underwrite a 20 year life. So this is an enormous resource base. And Pangaea made substantial investments in exploration back in the early days of this basin. And we look forward to moving those assets into development and production. If we turn to the next slide, I'll give you an, an, an overview of the busy season that's ongoing in this basin. So we drilled our first well on the eastern side of the basin, Carpentaria One, uh, about a year ago. We carried out a frack job and flow test on that well uh, just in recent months. And just a couple of days ago, we announced some really encouraging results indicating the presence of liquids rich gas. Um, the, pre the experience in the US has been the, the presence of those liquids can quite materially enhance the economics of the activity. To our immediate west is Santos, which is drilling two big horizontal appraisal wells right now, Tanabarini 2H and Tanabarini 3H, with results expected from those later this year. And we wish them all the very best with that program, which I believe will be a real basining opening, opening program for this basin. Uh, to their west is Origin Energy, Origin has drilled a number of wells. They're drilling a well on the liquids rich flank of the basin, very similar to our EP187 geology right now, called Bell Kerry 76. And also they're re-entering re -entering an existing well, a Mungie Northwest 1H, uh, which will be to uh, carry out further flow testing activity. So a very busy season ongoing in the basin. If we look to the next slide, I think it's really important for investors to understand that Shale basins are quite different to conventional oil and gas fields. In the old days, people had to find the specific pods of oil and gas that were contained in uh, finite traps. The beauty of shale gas is that it's extensive across enormous areas, and that's what drives these very large resource numbers and allows us as an industry to leverage off each other's success to move towards commercialization. What this slide shows is uh, wells that have been drilled all the way from the western side of the basin right through the basin over to the eastern side of the basin. And it demonstrates a very high consistency of the quality and uh, characteristics of these rocks right across the basin. So the great news about that is that we can all share in each other's success. And, and I wish our uh, other ventures in the basin the very best. Turning to the next slide. This just gives you a quick overview of what I've been discussing in relation to our program. So we drilled the, Tanim, uh, the Carpentaria One vertical wells, 1,915 metres, encountered an incredibly thick sequence of uh, hydrocarbon rich shale rocks. Uh, and during that drilling phase, identified the presence of heavier end hydrocarbons. So instead of just being dry methane, which is the experience in the Queensland coal seam fields, also the presence of these higher value liquid hydrocarbons. Um, we've been able to carry out these work programs in a highly cost efficient manner. Uh, as I mentioned, these rock characteristics are highly favourable compared to some of the major US shale basins. And we've had some really encouraging results with our initial vertical fracture stimulation program. 
We are currently finalising work program approvals for further work on this uh, asset, including the drilling of fracked horizontal appraisal wells. And uh, we're fully funded for drilling following a recent successful capital raise. So turning to the next slide, just to give you a quick reminder of all of the activity happening in the basin this year, we're finalising our approvals for drilling. We've just carried out a recent successful flow test. We've got the gas composition and zonal contribution data out. Uh, we'll be carrying out seismic soon and then looking to move into horizontal appraisal drilling. And then in terms of the properties we've just acquired Pangaea, we'll be carrying out a stakeholder engagement process. We think it's really important as a company that we work closely with all of the different stakeholder groups, particularly pastoralists and indigenous, uh, so that we can get onto the ground for them next year. Santos, as I mentioned, has got a two well program carrying on and Origin uh, will be is drilling as well. Just turning to my final slide, while these basins are remote, they are not um, market constrained. There are pipelines traversing the basin. Uh, there's a, a, a larger pipeline going north to south through the basin. Um, in the longer term, there will be more pipeline construction required, but our model is very focused on utilizing those existing pipelines to get into production as quickly as possible, and then look to build our, our production base from there. So thank you very much for your time. And if there are any more questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thanks, Alex. Um, there's, there's quite a few questions actually. Um, now, going back a step, you, you received a, some, uh, a government grant for the Beetaloo base, Basin. And in uh, this week, there's been some media around a Senate inquiry into that federal uh, funding. Can you give us uh, an idea of what the outcome was? Yeah, sure. So um, the, the federal government announced their Beetaloo Cooperative Drilling Program some months ago, we, we were the, one of the first companies to apply for that and we've been given an approval and are now moving into the documentation phase. Um, there, there was a, an inquiry set up led by the Greens party looking into the Beetaloo Basin and particularly the, the grants program itself. Um, an interim report has been lodged uh, and earlier this week, there was a, a critical vote in the Senate as to whether to disallow this instrument and the underlying funding package. And we were pleased to see that that, that vote uh, did not go through. So now the grant program can proceed as planned. And, and you've obviously got some, uh, there's some big players out there in terms of Santos and Origin. Do, do you have a good relationship with these majors? Does that help with you know, funding uh, your project in this area? Uh, yeah, we do. We've got, a, we've got an excellent relationship with, with the other players in the basin. Um, you know, we're all carrying out our own work programs, but I think uh, going back to what I was saying about the geology of shale, uh, I think the, the industry has recognised that we can all climb up on each other's shoulders towards that goal, towards commercialisation, rather than carrying out work programs on our own. And that, that collaboration tends to work really well in the Northern Territory context. And uh, you've got a question here, do, uh, do you have any traditional owner uh, sent for Eastern Basin activities? Yeah, so that's an excellent question. So uh, on our Eastern uh, block, EP187, where we've recently drilled, it's actually the first exploration tenement ever carried out on Aboriginal land. And um, you know, we've been working with traditional owners since 2011 on that. Our director, John Warburton, has been to, I think it's 27 on-country meetings across the areas over the last 10 years. And I've been out to a number of them. I've taken my family out to one of them. Um, and we work really hard on uh, a traditional owner engagement. Uh, we do have the full and informed consent of the traditional owners for that activity, for those activities. And we continue to consult with traditional owners as we carry out our activities, including having them on country uh, before uh, any clearing activities to make sure that sacred sites are protected. And, and obviously, you know, we've seen, you've been in this space for a long time, your background in Macquarie. Um, ESG principles are a big focus for institutional investors and for banks in regards to funding. How have you seen that landscape change recently and and where does kind of lng sit on the scale if renewables is here and lng and well, coal and oil are down the bottom how, how does that all play out in terms of getting funding it's a highly topical um area right now the the world is changing dramatically in this regard um you know irrespective of whatever governments around the world want to aim for i think um you know the, the corporate world is is definitely moving rapidly, even on a voluntary basis. Um, we, we pointed out at our annual general meeting earlier this year that we're gonna be putting out an ESG policy this year. 
for us, the environmental aspects of what we do are important, but, but the social and governance aspects operating onshore in the Northern Territory with a range of stakeholder groups, including Indigenous, we think are also critically important. What, one critical point I would make about the Beedaloo Basin's uh, gas resources, and you'll see this in our announcement earlier this week, is that it contains incredibly low levels of CO2 in the reservoir. So all gas fields have CO2 in the reservoir. They can often be 10 or 15% of the total stream. We've, we've told the market earlier this week that we are less than 1% CO2. And so that, I believe, will make our assets in this basin have a competitive advantage over others as prices for carbon come in in the years ahead and we start to actually price that externality. Um, in terms of support from the market, we've, we've got a very supportive shareholder base who have really been behind us uh, and I believe will continue to support us. But certainly in terms of as we move into development, uh, banks are right onto this. You've got to demonstrate that you're, uh, you're an environmentally responsible operator if you want to get access to their capital.